I just don't get it. Brad, I need more views on YouTube. Chad, in order to get more views on YouTube, you need to do one of two things. One, you can have good ideas. Or two, you can show your boobs. <sighs> well, I don't have any of those. Good ideas, of course. But if you think it's the best course of action, uh, you know, on second thought, Chet, um, let's just try something that's already worked for you. Uh, what, what's the highest viewed video that you already have? Uh, well, it looks like it was, oh, the Top 10 Fire Emblem Awakening Canonical Relationships. Well, that's just it, Chet. You gotta do the same thing for its sequel. Ah, brilliant idea, Brad. Chet, dude, you misspelled relationships. Oh, well, you know, it's a pretty hard word. You misspelled fire! been in the works since 2015. It's a follow-up to one of my most viewed videos which came out in 2014. The top 10 relationships in Fire Emblem Awakening. Oh, that video was a mess! I didn't know how to balance audio and my choices. I, I, I played through the game three times and out of the, the marriages I had unlocked, that's what I chose from. No, 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 no. This time, I actually unlocked every single marriage. Pr probably. I, I, there's 425 marriages that I read through, and I've decided my top 10, so I feel, I feel more qualified to discuss this one. So without any further screwing around, roll that title card! Hello, YouTube, and welcome to Game Games Top 10 Canonical Relationships of Fire Emblem Fakes! An opinion piece. Marriage in Fire Emblem. This, in combination with a proper advertising budget, dragged Fire Emblem for a dying franchise into an absolute monolith for Nintendo. I mean, who doesn't like having a cast of over 30 waifus to marry? We've got hot chicks, we've got smart chicks, we have chicks that if you marry them you get placed on an FBI watch list, everything you could ever want. In addition to choosing yourself a bride, you can also force every unit in your army into an arranged marriage. The thing that I love the most about Fire Emblem is that they include hundreds of unique conversations, knowing full and well that a majority of players will never see even 25% of them all. But I'm not a majority of players. Over the past three years, whenever I've watched a TV show, I've also sat down with my 3DS and grinded every last support conversation out of this game. Well, except for child-parent dialogue. I mean, I'm insane, but I tried this in Awakening and it nearly killed me. So, while playing Matchmaker, some of the dialogue is definitely more romantic than others. After reading all of the conversations and giving them a 1 through 10 star rating, I have determined the 10 best conversations. Conversations that felt natural. Conversations that felt loving. Conversations that felt canonical. Okay, so before we start, I have some honorable mentions. Conversations that were pretty good, but just barely didn't make it. Or one of the spouses actually had a better relationship that made it onto this list. Also, I'm not going to be putting the Avatar on this list. That said though, female Avatar and Xander definitely deserves a mention. Along with Ignatius and Valoria, Ignatius and Selkie, Selkie and Shiro, Odin and Selina, Odin and Camilla, Saizo and Rinka, Saizo and Mozu, Mozu and Kaze, Kaze and Sakura, and just a whole ton of Ophelia relationships. Alright, now for my top 10. Alright, so this list starts off as all great top 10s do, with a little bit of incest. Wait, no! They don't relate my blood! Okay, so I'm hoping that you have a baseline understanding of Fire Emblem Fates for this list. So the sea conversation has Azura trying to honor the queen's wish of treating Takumi like a brother, and he's really not having any of it. And the B conversation is pretty unique because it's a support conversation with another character in it. There's this little lost kid, and they helped get the kid home. And the A support conversation is them celebrating and agreeing to be friends. But if you get that S rank conversation, Takumi admits that the reason he didn't want Azura treating him like a brother is because he didn't want to get brother zoned by the woman that he loved. And Azura agreed that she also wanted a romantic relationship with Takumi as well, and I just thought the whole thing was really sweet. But hey, while I'm talking about Takumi, I just gotta say that the most canon relationship is the one between Takumi and Leo. While it's not necessarily a romantic relationship, if they were to make an anime of Fire Emblem Fates, they would definitely have their conversation. Because, you know, it goes a little something like this. Put them in a room together, they get into an argument. Hey, f*** you. Hey, f*** you too. 
So, as most of you know, Fire Emblem characters have a severe case of flanderization. You know, a key trait that they are completely built around, like Effie being a protein-obsessed bodybuilder, Niles giving off a kind of rapey vibe, and Hisame? Well, he lacks pickles. Our love is stronger than the world's most pungent pickle. Won't you dive into the brine with me? Well, after reading several character support conversations back to back, I realized that they're not all as two-dimensional as you might think. Most of them have secondary traits. Some have as many as four sub-traits. Take, for example, Caden and Setsuna. Caden's trait is that he always makes sure that he pays people back. Payback! And Setsuna, she falls into traps. How is that a personality trait? However, they both share the sub-trait of being great hunters. Their sea support conversation starts with Caden asking Setsuna to help him with hunting, since she's so good with a bow. Setsuna says that she'd like to, but she'll probably just fall into traps the whole time and really slow Caden down. However, Caden tells her that he is highly adept at finding traps, and he'll keep her out of harm's way. Well, in their B conversation, they're hunting again, but they mostly discuss Caden's trap perception. But in their A conversation, they agree to be hunting partners since they're so good at it together. And it's mentioned that Setsuna never got trapped while around Caden. And if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the very few conversations where she doesn't get trapped at least once. I love this conversation because they really do complete one another. And in their final conversation, they mentioned that they would be great together. Heck, Setsuna even uses the L word. Now, while the last group had matching secondary traits, these characters' main trait is very similar. They grew up in the slums, they never knew their parents, and they have done some bad stuff. And the conversations are based around those facts. So Conversation C starts with Niles stalking Baruka through the slums. He decides to confront her and ask what sort of unsavory business she has there. Strange. If you're so skilled at tracking, then you should already know my business there. And Niles can't really get an answer. This also happened in the B conversation. He stalked her, lost track of her, but still wants to know what she was up to. But she still won't confess. But finally, in the A conversation, she allowed herself to be tracked. Although Baruka never knew her mother, she learned of her grave and visits it occasionally. And it just so happens that Niles' mother is buried nearby. She asks if he'd like to go meet her grave, but Niles declines. However, this is the beginning of a newfound respect between the two characters. But finally, in the S rank, Niles goes to Baruka and tells her that he talked to his mother's gravestone about getting married, and that the gravestone said yes. The ocean says yes. I really like this relationship. I like that two people who are so similar can find happiness in one another's twisted embrace. Pickle Rick and Haiku Girl. So while his maze trait never rears its ugly head, Mitama's trait is on full display. Laziness. She is too lazy to go to today's war council meeting, and when Hisame enters, he is horrified at the state of her room. We should invite the war council over here. Clearly there's been an unreported attack. Have you cleaned your room... ever? And faithfully lazy Mitama says that she'll attend the meeting if Hisame agrees to clean her room. And he does. The B and A conversations are basically cleaning the room, and there's some fun back and forth between the two of them, but I love the S rank. So Mitama needs Hisame's help because her room has fallen into disrepair again. Hisame agrees, but he is shocked at how bad it has gotten. I don't understand how every book you own has found its way on the floor again. It's almost like you let it get this way on purpose. And while that line is funny, the romantic line is this one. I thought I was pretty slick offering to help you clean just to spend time with you. I didn't realize you were making the mess worse on purpose. So the fact that they both went to extreme lengths just to spend time with one another I found super sweet and I just had to include it on my list. Alright, so this one follows the C support formula for these characters perfectly. Charlotte attempting to seduce a man with a lunch, and Anigo trying to have tea with a woman but ultimately getting shot down. Shot down. I love how their formulas work so well together. The B conversation is Anigo trying for that tea again, and Charlotte annoyed that Lazlo doesn't really have any pushback against her advances, and eventually she snaps. 
And like most of Charlotte's A conversations, after revealing her true self to the person, they accept her as she is. But in this alternate reality, Laszlo actually scores a spot of tea. But the S conversation is where this one shines. It shows their true characters and accepting one another. And you know, I think I like this relationship so much because in the other relationships, they don't really ask their partner for what they truly want. What they both want is to keep on flirting. They agree to let the other person be themselves, so long as at the end of the day, they're still number one in each other's books. Heck, we even had both of the characters using the L word. So this relationship starts with Azuma just really negging Hinoga, just laying into her. After about the third insult, she just straight up threatens him with her Naginata and he runs away. The B support is much different. It has Hinoka lamenting the loss of soldiers today and Azuma accepting it. She finds that kind of odd since he saved her years ago. And he says that he only saved her because the fury in her eyes while she was at death door intrigued him. And so she ends up calling him a sociopath. And then the A support has Hinoka worried because the soldier is about to die. She knows that Azuma is a skilled healer and orders him to attempt to save the man against his better judgment. And even though he tried, the soldier ended up dying. And then they just end up spouting philosophy in one another. But the S support is where this relationship shines. So, Azuma walks in on Hinoka and tells her that they're getting married. She's all, what? But Azuma explains that she doesn't really respect anyone in the army as much as she respects him. And she's the only one reckless and interesting enough for him to marry. Also, I give a lot of points to a relationship if they say that they're a perfect match. Also, I love the banter between these two. It reminds me a lot of Bowie and Mei, which, by the way, is my favorite Fire Emblem relationship. All right, so the next two females on this list are top tier grade A girlfriend material. It was very tough to narrow down who they should marry, but ultimately I figured that Mozu should marry Keaton. Their conversations are so great. So it starts and they're just talking and Mozu out of nowhere accuses Keaton of being a bomb kid. He adamantly denies this, but she's too wise for his ploy. The next conversation, they discuss what they did before the war. Keaton says that he actually really enjoyed hunting. Hunting, eh? Kind of like a... Bomb... Kid. The next conversation, they are hunting together and they bag themselves a rabbit, and they think that they make excellent hunting partners. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> we bumpkins gotta stick together, don't we? I ain't no darn bumpkin! Ah, uh, never mind. In any case, I agree. We should probably stick together. Friends? I really enjoy the playful teasing throughout the first three, but the fourth is fantastic. So they bag a deer and then they talk about how good of hunting partners they are. Heck, maybe they should even get married after the war. Mojo tells Keaton not to joke about such things, but he says he's not joking. Her country girl charm is perfect for a bumpkin like him. All right, you wanna know how I know that Percy and Ophelia's relationship is a good one? Because Ophelia scored nines and tens across the board, but I finally decided that this was my favorite one. So the first few conversations are fun, but they don't really stand out. Percy finds a bag of gold, and he hates finding bags of gold because he has to find the true owner. Ophelia thinks that Percy might be the chosen one and has him go through some silly challenges to see if he is, like grabbing a white bead out of hundreds of black ones without looking. Clear segregation. Then she has him grab this one candy out of a bunch of identical looking ones. One of them is sweet, while the others are spicy. Clearly trying to bring back early 20th century Jim Crow laws. The A conversation is kind of boring because they ultimately give up on trying to find out if Percy is a chosen one because the last one is just too dangerous. But here's the thing, each relationship on this list has an aha moment where I think to myself, these two should be together. This S conversation has two. The first one comes when Ophelia is talking about charms that she can cast. For example, she has one that can make the user have a dream that involves the person they're going to marry. She just can't promise that it'll be a good dream. Percy declines the offer because he wouldn't want a dream where Ophelia is chasing him around with a knife. And the second aha moment is where she does this charm where she links their fate with a piece of string. She asks Percy if he'd like her to sever the ties and he says, No! Tie more strings! These two are just too cute!
Okay, so when I thought of this list back in the early 1800s, I really wanted to include this at number 10, just for the lols, because Tsubaki's kid is Kaldori. Wouldn't it be hilarious if Selena was Kaldori's mom? But dang, this conversation is good. And it makes a lot of sense. You might not know this, but Selena, she has some mommy issues. And her mother's trope was she was perfect at everything she tries. Well, along comes Tsubaki, a man who's perfect at everything he tries. Just a baseline understanding of Freudian psychology, there is no way these two wouldn't get married, causing a time paradox where Selena is her own grandma. It's not the most romantic support in the game, but in all honesty, it still is pretty romantic, but it feels real. Okay, from start to finish, this is a fantastic love story. So right off the bat, Silas addresses Nyx's trope. Yo, Nyx, is it true that you're older than me? Yes, much older. Why's that? Because I dabbled in dark magic. You want to reverse the spell? Yes, but you can't reverse this spell. Challenge accepted! And conversation B has Silas bring her a powder that claimed to cure curses. But Nyx saw through that clever disguise, and revealed it was merely a headache powder sold by a snake oil salesman. However, she appreciates Silas' effort, but this spell cannot be broken. But that won't deter Silas. The A conversation has Silas bring Nyx a new powder. It's made of mandrake root, toad tongues, dragon dung, as well as some ingredients he isn't willing to name. Because if he tells her what's in it, she won't agree to drink it. Regardless of that, she still won't drink it. But she really is thankful to Silas. But the S rank is just fantastic. D did Christopher Sparks write this? So, other Nyx conversations have people feeling pity for her and wanting to help, but they're all ultimately fruitless. But this one mentions that Nyx is a soothsayer and that she had a vision that if a pure-hearted man offered his heart up to her, that slowly as their relationship continued, her sins would be absolved and the spell would slowly be lifted. Nothing else in this game offers a way out of the curse, so not marrying these two together would be just cruel to Nyx. I love all four of their supports and find it super romantic. And I'm very pleased to place it at number one. But hey, those are only my ten favorites, so if there's a relationship that you thought was pretty good, go ahead and put it in the comments. You know, I actually have them all unlocked so I can easily pull it up and read what you thought was the best. But with all of that said, I think, I think we're at the end. I can ask you to subscribe because I, I, do, I do Fire Emblem content. You know, I also do other content, but definitely that one that comes out for the Switch, I'm, I'm going to have to lay my eye on it. Well, I guess that reaches the end of the video. So, this is the end. Forgive me, everyone. In the end, I wasn't able to accomplish anything.